Went to the store to buy some beer and was happy to notice that all the Oktoberfest seasonals were in stock. When I returned home, I got to rereading an old book over a few pints. It's from a rather spooky and forthright philosopher. So grab a glass of something, take a seat, and enjoy as I share a few of its more captivating quotes. Nothing is more to me than myself. The child was realistic, taken up with the things of the world, till little by little he succeeded in getting at what was back of these very things. The youth was idealistic, inspired by thoughts, till he worked his way up to where he became the man, the egoistic man, who deals with things and thoughts according to his heart's pleasure, and sets his personal interest above everything. Yes, the whole world is haunted, only is haunted? Nay, it itself walks, it is uncanny through and through. It is the wandering, seeming body of a spirit. It is a spook. Look out, near, far, a ghostly world surrounds you everywhere. You are always having apparitions or visions. Everything that appears to you is only the phantasm of an indwelling spirit, is a ghostly apparition. The world is to you only a world of appearances, behind which the spirit walks. You see spirits. But to you the whole world is spiritualized, and has become an enigmatical ghost. Therefore do not wonder if you likewise find in yourself nothing but a spook. Since the spirit appeared in the world since the word became flesh, since then the world has been spiritualized, enchanted, a spook. When one looks to the bottom of anything, i.e. searches out its essence, one often discovers something quite other than what it seems to be, honeyed speech and a lying heart pompous words, and beggarly thoughts, etc. To know and acknowledge essences alone and nothing but essences, that is religion. Its realm is a realm of essences, spooks, and ghosts. The longing to make the spook comprehensible or to realize nonsense has brought about a corporeal ghost, a ghost or spirit with a real body, an embodied ghost. Man, your head is haunted. You have wheels in your head. You imagine great things and depict to yourself a whole world of gods that has an existence for you, a spirit realm to which you suppose yourself to be called, an ideal that beckons to you. You have a fixed idea. Is not all the stupid chatter of, e.g., most of our newspapers, the babble of fools who suffer from the fixed idea of morality, legality, Christianity, etc., and only seem to go about free because the madhouse in which they walk takes in so broad a space? Every day now lays bare the cowardice and vindictiveness of these maniacs, and the stupid populace hurrahs for their crazy measures. Is it perchance only people possessed by the devil that meet us, or do we often come upon people possessed in the contrary way? Possessed by the good, by virtue, morality, the law, or some principle or other. Possessions of the devil are not the only ones. God works on us, and the devil does. The former workings of grace, the latter workings of the devil. Possessed people are set in their opinions. Love is what is human in man, and what is inhuman is the loveless egoist. In short, people would like to have the one but not go without the other. They would like to have a free will, but not for their lives lack the moral will. Just come in contact with the servile loyalist, you liberals. You will sweeten every word of freedom with a look of the most loyal confidence, and he will clothe his servilism in the most flattering phrases of freedom. Then you go apart, and he, like you, thinks, I know you, Fox. He sends the devil in you, as much as you do the dark old Lord God in him. The moral man is necessarily narrow, in that he knows no other enemy than the immoral man. He who is not moral is immoral, and accordingly reprobate, despicable, etc. Therefore, the moral man can never comprehend the egoist. Who is there that has never more or less consciously noticed that our whole education is calculated to produce feelings in us, i.e. impart them to us, instead of leaving their production to ourselves, however they may turn out? The young are of age when they twitter like the old. They are driven through school to learn the old song, and when they have this by heart, they are declared of age. Today one again hears seriousness praised seriousness in the presence of highly important subjects and discussions, German seriousness, etc. 
This sort of seriousness proclaims clearly how old and grave lunacy and possession have already become. For there is nothing more serious than a lunatic when he comes to the central point of his lunacy. Then his great earnestness incapacitates him for taking a joke. See Madhouses. Man has not really vanquished shamanism and its spooks till he possesses the strength to lay aside not only the belief in ghosts or in spirits, but also the belief in the spirit. But who then will dissolve the spirit into nothing? He who by means of the spirit set forth nature as the null, finite, transitory, he alone can bring down the spirits too, too like nullity. I can, each one among you can. Who does his will as an absolute I? In a word, the egoist can. For little children, just as for animals, nothing sacred exists. Because in order to make room for this conception, one must already have progressed so far in understanding that he can make distinctions like good and bad, warranted and unwarranted, etc. Only at such a level of reflection or intelligence, the proper standpoint of religion, can unnatural, i.e. brought into existence by thinking, reverence, sacred dread, step into the place of natural fear. But the uncultured are really nothing but children, and he who attends only to the necessities of his life is indifferent to those spirits. But because he is also weak before them, he succumbs to their power, and is ruled by thoughts. This is the meaning of hierarchy. Hierarchy is dominion of thoughts, dominion of mind. We are hierarchic to this day, kept down by those who are supported by thoughts. Thoughts are the sacred. In Hegel it comes to light at last what a longing for things even the most cultured man has, and what a horror of every hollow theory he harbors. With him reality, the world of things is altogether to correspond to the thought, and no concept to be without reality. This caused Hegel's system to be known as the most objective, as if in it thought and thing celebrated their union. But this was simply the extremest case of violence on the part of thought its highest pitch of despotism and soul dominion, the triumph of mind, and with it, the triumph of philosophy. What they have taken into their head, what shall we call it but fixed idea? Why, their head is haunted. The most oppressive spook is man. He who is infatuated with man leaves persons out of account so far as that infatuation extends, and floats in an ideal, sacred interest. Man, you see, is not a person, but an ideal, a spook. If you command them, bend before the Most High, they will answer, If he wants to bend us, let him come himself and do it. We, at least, will not bend of our own accord. And if you threaten them with his wrath and his punishment, they will take it like being threatened with a boogeyman. If you are no longer successful in making them afraid of ghosts, then the dominion of ghosts is at an end, and nurses' tales find no faith. This is the principle of modern philosophy, the genuine Christian principle. Descartes in his own time discriminated the body sharply from the mind, and the spirit tis that builds itself the body, says Goethe. But this philosophy itself, Christian philosophy, still does not get rid of the rational, and therefore inveighs against the merely subjective, against fancies, fortuities, arbitrariness, etc. What it wants is that the divine should become visible in everything, and all consciousness become a knowing of the divine, and man behold God everywhere. But God never is without the devil. Descartes, cogito ergo sum, has the meaning one lives only when one thinks. Thinking life is called intellectual life. Only mind lives. Its life is the true life. Then, just so in nature, only the eternal laws, the mind or the reason of nature, are its true life. In man, as in nature, only the thought lives. Everything else is dead. To this abstraction, to the life of generalities, or of that which is lifeless, the history of mind had to come. God, who is spirit, alone lives. Nothing lives but the ghost. The case of morality is like that of the family. Many a man renounces morals, but with great difficulty the conception, morality. Morality is the idea of morals, their intellectual power, their power over the conscience. 
On the other hand, morals are too material to rule the mind and do not fetter an intellectual man, a so-called independent, a free thinker. How little man is able to control. He must let the sun run its course, the sea roll its waves, the mountains rise to heaven. Thus he stands powerless before the uncontrollable. Can he keep off the impression that he is helpless against this gigantic world? Concepts are to decide everything. Concepts to regulate life, concepts to rule. This is the religious world to which Hegel gave a systematic expression, bringing method into the nonsense and completing the conceptual precepts into a rounded, firmly based dogmatic. Everything is sung according to concepts, and the real man, i.e. I, am compelled to live according to these conceptual laws. Now nothing but mind rules in the world, and an innumerable multitude of concepts buzz about in people's heads. And what are those doing who endeavor to get further? They are negating these concepts to put new ones in their place. They are saying, you form a false concept of right, of the state, of man, of liberty, of truth, of marriage, etc. The concept of right, etc. is rather that one which we now set up. Thus the confusion of concepts moves forward. If you devour the sacred, you have made it your own. Digest the sacramental wafer, and you are rid of it. The obedient servant is the free man? What glaring nonsense. Yet this is the sense of the bourgeoisie and its poet Goethe, as well as its philosopher Hegel. Succeeded in glorifying the dependence of the subject on the object, obedience to the objective world, etc. Political liberty, this fundamental doctrine of liberalism, is nothing but a second phase of Protestantism and runs quite parallel with religious liberty. State, religion, conscience, these despots make me a slave, and their liberty is my slavery. No one has any business to give me orders. Orders carries the idea that what I am to do is another man's will, while law does not express a personal authority of another. Lock up the vagabond, thrust the breeder of unrest into the darkest dungeon. He wants to arouse dissatisfaction and incite people against existing institutions in the state. Stone him, stone him. If an age is imbued with an error, some always derive advantage from the error, while the rest have to suffer from it. Money governs the world is the keynote of the civic epic. The possessors rule, but the state trains up from the destitute its servants, to whom, in proportion as they are to rule, govern, in its name, it gives money, a salary. Therefore, the non-possessor will regard the state as a power protecting the possessor, which privileges the latter, but does nothing for him, the non-possessor, but to suck his blood. Labor is badly paid. The capitalist has the greatest profit from it. The state rests on the slavery of labor. If labor becomes free, the state is lost. Before the supreme proprietor, we all become equal, ragamuffins. For the present, one is still, in another's estimation, a ragamuffin. I have nothing. But then this estimation ceases. We are all ragamuffins together and as the aggregate of communistic society, we might call ourselves a ragamuffin crew. When the proletarian shall really have founded his proposed society, in which the interval between rich and poor is to be removed, then he will be a ragamuffin. For then he will feel that it amounts to something to be a ragamuffin, and might lift ragamuffin to an honorable form of address, just as the revolution did with the word citizen. Ragamuffin is his ideal. We are all to become ragamuffins. Now, on the contrary, when everyone is to cultivate himself into man, condemning a man to machine-like labor amounts to the same thing as slavery. If a factory worker must tire himself to death 12 hours and more, he is cut off from becoming man. Society, from which we have everything, is a new master, a new spook, a new supreme being, 
which takes us into its service and allegiance. It is precisely the keenest critic who is hit hardest by the curse of his principle. Putting from him one exclusive thing after another, shaking off churchliness, patriotism, etc., he undoes one tie after another and separates himself from the churchly man, from the patriot, etc., till at last when all ties are undone he stands alone. He of all men must exclude all that have anything exclusive or private, and when you get to the bottom, what can be more exclusive than the exclusive single person himself? Everything private is left free, i.e., it has no interest for society. In humane liberalism, ragamuffinhood is completed. We must first come down to the most ragamuffin-like, most poverty-stricken condition if we want to arrive at ownness. For we must strip off everything alien, but nothing seems more ragamuffin-like than naked man. It is more than ragamuffinhood, however, when I throw away man too, because I feel that he too is alien to me, and that I can make no pretensions on that basis. This is no longer mere ragamuffinhood, because even the last rag has fallen off. Here stands real nakedness, denundation of everything alien. The ragamuffin has stripped off ragamuffinhood itself, and therewith has ceased to be what he was, a ragamuffin. I am no longer a ragamuffin, but have been one. Liberalism as a whole has a deadly enemy, an invincible opposite, as God has the devil. By the side of man stands always the unman, the individual, the egoist. State, society, humanity do not master this devil. Humane liberalism has undertaken the task of showing the other liberals that they still do not want freedom.